Hello, everyone. We continuing our conversations on uh, Ukraine, and today I have the pleasure of talking to uh, Dmitry Tuzhansky, who is the CEO of the Institute for Central European Strategy. He's been, a, in addition to that, he's been a political consultant and worked for various international think tanks and organizations. And also, Dmitry, correct me if I'm wrong, you also worked as a election observer in various uh, countries. Yeah, correct. 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 Hello. Okay, so it's a, it's a pleasure uh, to meet you again and uh, to continue our conversations. And today, what I would like to do, I would like to talk uh, with you about um, Central Eastern Europe. Uh, I know that you are a huge fan of this region. You are one of the promoters of this collective identity. And uh, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to talk about this region in general, but also about uh, separate countries. Uh, and uh, of course, we'll talk about them, about these topics in relation to the situation in Ukraine and the ongoing war uh, uh, and uh, ongoing Russian aggression against Ukraine. So maybe, you know, we could start with the general question. Uh, and then we'll talk about specific countries. Uh, but I always uh, feel a little bit. Um, and well, first, I always feel enthusiastic about Central Eastern Europe as a separate region. It's always, uh, it seems that such a region exists. I, I always think, first of all, to Pilsudski, the a great Polish national leader who had this vision of this region in uh, Intermarium, which goes from uh, the Baltic to the Black Sea and to the Adriatic. And so we have kind of common destiny and common history and it seems common values. But then after this initial wave of enthusiasm <laughs> goes away a little bit, I start thinking then when you start considering separate uh, countries, it uh, this uh, this enthusiasm very very quickly is, is substituted by some skepticism. So you know my general question, Vitor, is in what sense can we talk uh, about uh, Central Eastern Europe uh, historically, but also uh, today in 2023? Is there this collective identity, and if there is, what is it based on? Very, very good question and a very substantial one. And uh, it's important uh, to answer, to address this question with a very honest answer. And uh, this is a trap a bit, because as you told uh, already that this idea of central Europe, and it's not just about this concept of Pilsudski, but the vision of Milan Kundera, which is, you know, very, uh, often mentioned in this regard, or we could uh, refer to Václav Havel and, uh, you know, even Timothy Snyder, we could, or, uh, or, or Mr. Jot, yes, or, or, or many others, or, or um, you know, it, it depends mainly, it, it doesn't matter if the historians or political scientists or politicians. So this idea is very, very nice, very, you know, attractive. Uh, even I could use this word sexy, especially for people from this region, yeah? You know, for them to show up, uh, for them to uh, distinguish themselves from, uh, in terms of, you know, like politics, policies, and identity as such. But at the same time, and uh, this is also a part of the trap, that, yeah, what about the skepticism you mentioned? So is it just a wishful thinking, a dream, or, I don't know, an essay by Milan Kundera, or it could be a doctrine or policy, yeah, a multilateral cooperation. Is it possible or not? And um, I think, you know, the events nowadays, before and all these events, they could be used as a proof uh, for both, you know, for the skepticism and for beautiful things. Usually for skepticism, to be honest, um, especially when we as, a, I don't know, political scientists or 
um, you know, or like active politicians. I'm not an active politician, but in this regard, it's more about, okay, no, we should be selfish. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, countries uh, think only about ourselves and, and, and so on and so forth. No cooperation. Yeah. Everybody wants to use us. So it's a bit this resentment. Um, but it's interesting and it's important also to mention that this idea of Central Europe, so it has a, a pretty long history. So I want to also refer to such a concept as a Mittel Europa, so a very German concept. Uh, yeah, this is the, uh, the, the, the concept of the space, geopolitical space. So it's important to, to highlight. And when we talk about Central Europe, we should talk about geopolitics and we should think and invent, reinvent this new geopolitical language. Yeah. And this Mittel Europa, this is one of these, one of these concepts, uh, German concept. Yeah. It's a concept how, uh, this German state empire should develop, but in that time it was the question to expand. Uh, yeah, this uh, like a space for this empire. Yeah, because uh, German empire, German state uh, in that period of time. So it's like I don't know, 19th century or even before. So it was 19th century. Yeah, because before it was a bit, a bit not, 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 not in this case. Yeah, so it was also trapped in between this French Empire and Russian Empire. Yeah, so these these spheres, and it was very very simple logic. So for Germany, it was the concept to to find this uh, new space to expand. And uh, in this regard, we should name such a politician, the philosopher, like Friedrich Neumann. Yes, and it it was his concept. Uh, for example, we could also discuss this concept of Central Europe as um, in, in, in a very varied versions of uh, 20th century, of actually uh, this uh, German, I don't know, it's imperialism or what, yeah, but it was the Second World War, it was also about the Central Europe, and it was the exact battle between Germany and uh, actually Soviet Union about these spheres of influence yeah and for uh two of them it was also um, it was not about central europe it was about to incorporate central europe inside their let's say visions of their empires yeah because for soviet union it was this slavic something or pan-slavic something for german it was the another another idea but still so imperialistic idea yeah and um when we uh, take um, these these more let's say recent or modern modern concept or modern period of time, so we will have and we'll you know track these initiatives like V four and V four this cooperation was in V four which was like V three uh, when we when we check it the real ground of this cooperation it started even before it was it started within warsaw uh warsaw block yeah this cooperation between czechoslovakia hungary and 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 poland it was pretty active already within within this within this stuff um or if we uh take the period back this exact essay of milan kundera about strategy of central europe it was um, also described this region, but also with Romania. He referred to to Romania concept uh, or to Romania case as a as a, as, a, as a cultural. Uh, interesting. Now I should interpret Kundera in this regard, but as a, as a, as a uh, one of the example why this uh, intention of Soviet Union based on Slavic unity doesn't work or didn't work or is it just a fake because Romania or Hungary it's out of this Slavic pan-Slavic old stuff yeah um, and um, then right now we have this intermarium or three season initiative yes um, uh, and uh, what what is interesting if we like follow this line uh, in terms of, let's say, this thinking, wishful thinking in this regard, because politicians is also this wishful thinking, yeah? And this imperialism is a real wishful thinking, very often, more than just a doctrine. 
And uh, when we check the exact negotiations or demands, I put this quotation uh, demands because it's hard to, to interpret as, as a real demands by Putin before the invasion to Ukraine. Uh, for example, his statement that NATO should roll back its, I don't know, influence or presence until 1997. And if we check how NATO expand after 1997, it will be exactly the tragedy of Central Europe. So for Russia, it's, or Putin's Russia, let's say like this, this is exactly, so rebuild something not just like within Soviet Union, yeah, I don't know, I don't know, frame or, or scope, but also with this uh, buffer zone. And when I uh, use right now buffer zone, it means not Ukraine. Yeah, Ukraine, it's a part of this. Buffer zone should be, uh, I mean, Hungary, actually Slovakia. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, very often in terms of these hybrid methods or campaigns, uh, Russia actively used recent decade, I think, both in Slovakia, Hungary, I think in Balkans, is an exact uh, campaign on buffer zone. Yeah, so it, this is this, uh, this is fear. So this is about wishful thinking. So definitely this, this region definitely exists, uh, exists in, um, uh, in language, in thinking, in ambitions, and so on. But it's a question, could this um, region um, like um, invent or identify itself uh, as a uh, constructive part of something bigger and something more inclusive than just empires, yeah? Because what I describe usually and what we describe in terms of, you know, thinking, wishful thinking, it's more about the territory to control, yeah, territory to have influence on, and usually it's rude influence, yeah, and if, especially in terms of Russia, but about the region which could, you know, uh, be the player, could uh, set an agenda for itself or for something bigger, like transatlantic community, yeah, <laughs> which is now I think the most uh, reasonable uh, agenda we could discuss because of membership of mentioning countries uh, in EU and NATO and very realistic, I think, historical shift of Ukraine from this Eurasia, if we use this American. Uh, geopolitical, I don't know, frame for this region from Eurasia part to European part. This is, I think, exactly what we are observing right now. This is exactly, uh, you know, strictly related to Russian invasion because Ukraine is moving, moving from one geopolitical, I don't know, it's not the region, but the reality to mm -hmm. another one. And, um, you know, this is why we actually establish our, our institute, me and my colleagues. This is what we do every day. And we try to check, is it just an idea or it's a working doctrine? Mm -hmm. And we try to check it uh, from this Ukraine point of view, because, you know, it's not the question of being biased, but, um, you know, I will share these arguments actually. Um, but Ukraine and the shift of Ukraine from Eurasia to Europe, it's, I think, the impulse uh, which, um, which makes Central Europe concept reborn, uh, forced to rethink and uh, reestablish as, as a real one, as a real sub-geopolitical region within transatlantic community which is something new for Central Europe because Central Europe we discussed one of the, the point how, and it's very often it's just the only um, uh, feature through which Central Europe tried every time to identify itself. I mean, from, from the, to oppose to somebody. Okay, we oppose to, to Russian empire and their ambition or its ambition to, you know, incorporate us into Soviet Union. And it was 90, 
56, 1968, etc., etc. Solidarity movement and so on, yeah? Uh, or within the European Union, what we right now see, how uh, V4 plus some other countries opposed to Brussels with the rhetorics, with the position towards, for example, such topic as migration, or even uh, Ukraine case, or grain export and so on and so forth. So very often, uh, I mean, mainly, this uh, when Central Europe appeared as a okay some um, some actor when they opposed to something, which is also very I think destructive uh, in terms of conceptualization of Central Europe as such. So this is a question, and Ukraine I think could could not it's it's not the question of you know some uniqueness of Ukraine. For example. Uh, this role could be, um, you know, shared by Belarus, yeah? Mm -hmm. If it will be a different, I think, you know, situation and with Belarus, yeah? Because this is one more big player, big country with these cultural, historical, and I think political bonds, uh, real one, uh, democratic one towards west than towards towards east. But right now, I think this is the exact momentum when we could talk about uh, real Central Europe, new Central Europe, um, about its reinvention, yeah, within Ukraine or with Ukraine. Sorry, so as its part with this impulse with Russian aggression. Yeah, it's to be short. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's fascinating. I think we'll we'll get back to Ukraine uh, quickly, but I. Just wanted to pick up um, among many things you said, which are worth attention. But uh, one is that uh, I think that uh, see Central Eastern Europe tends to think of itself as kind of as opposing something, and most more often than not, as opposing some imperial expansion, be it from the west or be it from the east. And I really liked what you said about this understanding that then you tend to think of yourself as a collection of small entities that then rely on each other for solidarity. So I think we feel that very, very strongly in, in uh, let's say, the Baltic states, but also in Central Europe. Uh, however, I think then we have a paradox, uh, which I think Hungary now embodies, I don't know if you would agree, is that for such a concept of Central Eastern Europe to function, the entities within it have to deal with their own imperial past and completely reject their own imperial ambitions. I think uh, uh, just recently I saw an interview with uh, uh, Yuval Harari, the, the famous author, and it was surprising to me that he gave... Uh, the example of our region of uh, of uh, Poland, Ukraine, and Lithuania in the in early nineties after the collapse of socialist system as a good way of how to let the bygones be bygones and just say we're sticking to the borders which we have. We are not reigniting our own uh, historical imperial ambitions. We're not going to fight about the uh, about the piece of land anymore. And so that is the idea, but uh, I think the reaction of Hungary to the Russian invasion shows that, uh, you know, solidarity is, is, is a very fragile concept. And uh, when, you know, it's, it's almost like a house of cards. When one card is taken away, everything seems to collapse very quickly. What do you think is the reason for... Uh, such a, I don't know how to say it politely, but such a reserved, not to say worse, uh, position of, of, of Hungary uh, with regards to Russian aggression in Ukraine. Uh, first of all, I, I, I totally agree and I'm sure that solidarity, which is very strong and very significant um, feature of Central Europe, is not enough. So. It, it should be as a value, as a, as, as a mood, um, the, the part of the concept of Central Europe. But 
it's not enough. And I think this is one of the problem when we rely only on solidarity, this, it, it will lead to the very strong, uh, you know, this skepticism regarding Central Europe as such. And Hungary is the best example, I think, after, after Russian invasion. Moreover, it's a very, I think, symbolic um, uh, kind of example, because if uh, we check uh, uh, what Russia did and is doing towards Ukraine, uh, you know, since 2022 or since 2014, actually, was the, uh, what Soviet Union did towards Hungary in 1956, we will have like very, you know, mysterious similarities. Because look, when you will go to the center, one of the center square of Budapest near the parliament, it's a Koshut Ter or Koshut Square, uh, you will see in the building uh, in front of the parliament, uh, you will see the holes from the bullets. Yeah, or just symbolic, symbolic uh, these, these uh, of signs. And uh, what is that? So in 1956, it was a peaceful meeting in this square, peaceful people with no weapon and so on. And these Soviet, I don't know, people, Soviet uh, army, policemen, they start shooting from the roofs, you know, for these people. And this is what exactly happened in Kiev in 2014. Yeah, and it was, meeting was about, uh, as Kundera mentioned, quoting the radio presenter, we are ready to die, the Hungarian uh, radio presenter, we are ready to die for Hungary and for Europe. So with the motto of Evromaidan, the same. Moreover, one mysterious thing, one of the motto of 1956 in Hungary was Dicuše ko Hushuknek. It's Hungarian, but it's translation like Heroyam uh, Slava, which means glory to the heroes. And this is exactly Ukrainian motto, which was labeled very, you know, often before as a Nazi motto, which is not actually, which is very ancient motto of Ukrainian independent movement. Yeah, since beginning of 20th century, actually, it's originally from Kharkiv, which is, you know, very often known as a Russian or pro-Russian city or so, but it's originally from there, yeah. Um, that's why solidarity is not enough, but, I think it's also a simplification when we, if we will uh, look at this reaction of Central Europe uh, regarding Russian invasion towards Ukraine only through this Hungarian accident or Hungarian case. Because, for example, if we check the sociology uh, for recent two years regarding the uh, Sovieticutes, of the population of some Central European countries towards Ukraine refugees. Or for example, what do you think who is more guilty or who is guilty actually in this war? So for example, you will see, or in, in terms of Hungary, it will be the same high level of support of supporting Ukraine refugees as in Poland. But in terms of Slovakia, it will be, you know, very bad numbers and very bad perception. And this is what we see, one of the patterns of the last election in Slovakia. So these anti-Ukrainian, uh, I don't know, attitudes, or at least rhetorics, was very well used. Similarly, it was anti-American rhetoric, which is, for example, right now, I think, the, the common pattern between Hungary and Slovakia. Or, if we will take Romania, uh, which is okay, the country, it is like in between, yeah, because it's partly Central River, partly Balkan state. So it's also, it's another, another big topic of debates, how we should distinguish or we should or not Central River from Baltic states, from Balkans, and where is it, you know, these, these links and where is the exact border. But anyway, in terms of Romania, you will see the very, this Asian, so why Zionistic, yeah, if I pronounce correct, attitude. So, uh, okay, we are ready to support Ukraine, but with no will at all to provide weapon, you know, heavy weapon. Okay, fuel could be, and, you know, at least one third, it depends how the uh, question is formulated, but one third of population of Romania with no pro-Russian sentiments at all. Romania is not pro-Russian country by the default, 
but they think that Russia was provoked by the West, which is also crazy. It's totally, let's say, Russian narrative. Yeah, that's why. And this is exactly what also actually unites the Central Europe or so Eastern flank. There is not just vulnerability as such, but also these traumas, this resentment, trauma in terms of anti-Americanism, anti-Western behavior, nationalistic, so isolationalistic behavior. Sorry, it's hard to pronounce me this 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 word in, in so in English. Yeah, but this is exactly what what we see. Yes, and simultaneously with the exact solidarity, because you know I couldn't tell you that we don't feel solidarity from Romania. It's solidarity, yeah, but a specific one. For example, in terms of grain export, Romania showed the highest solidarity possible among Central European countries. For example, Hungary showed one of the highest, maybe it's hard to compare with Poland, but one of the highest solidarity in terms of refugee support, yeah? Mm -hmm. It, they showed in terms of humanitarian support, not weapon support, unfortunately. So this is also also this important pattern how this region could and should overcome common challenges. Because from my point of view, this resentment or resentment or so this this isolationism or anti-Western potential anti-Western behavior, it's a danger for Ukraine as well in the future. Yeah, and. You know, this is the question of how to be the part fulfill or full part of the West having this sentiment. And this is, a, I think, a common challenge for all. Regarding Hungary, very simple. Why was such a reaction? Yeah, it is easy to, and I think this is the, you know, the key explanation, not historical something, not this game of Orban with Putin. It matters, of course, but... Orban made a mistake. He didn't think that invasion possible. He thought it was the, you know, just uh, raising stakes by Russia, by US, just the rhetoric, campaign, blah, 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 all the stuff. He thought that it will be the same as it was in 2014. It will be new, I don't know, Minsk agreement or so. Second, Orban made the mistake, I think, my point of view, uh, during last actually 10 years, exactly before invasion, he finished his model of, to be honest, almost eternal power keeping because he organized his regime in a way, and then, you know, he hacked actually the Western demo democracy and the EU rules and so on, because he organized his regime in a way that he could balance within Hungary in terms of money, power, influence, and the, the, the politics could balance uh, both, you mean, West and East. For example, clean money from the EU for regional development according to the old rules, and the dirty money from the West, and it's not just Russia, it's a China as well, for, you know, this money laundering, cash laundering, when you need this cash to buy media, you know, to pay, to pay this royalty or rent for the loyalty actually to your people, yeah? And to have these very populistic projects like, for example, railway uh, to Belgrade for China money, which is actually uh, doesn't move as the same as a Pax 2 uh, nuclear power with Russian, which actually the project is already 10 years. But nothing, nothing happened. It's just on the paper. And also play this game that, you know, Orban is meeting with all these leaders. I mean, Trump, uh, oh, with Biden, it's impossible, of course. But, you know, Trump, even when Trump is not the president, but Trump is the president, was leader of the China, was the Putin, was this very crazy. So for Orban, this reaction and this very, like, this agilistic reaction, Taking also into account it was election period of time. For him, it was important to, you know, key motivation to keep power, to keep his system, this very hacked democracy system, a liberal democracy. And this is the reason why actually Orban doesn't want to, 
take any step back in his debates with, with the Brussels, you know, making his country suffering from lacking of money for three years already. You know, could you imagine this responsibility? So more than 10 uh, billions of euro, Hungary, uh, you know, have to receive, has to receive, but, you know, no money because Orban don't want, you know, to come back to the exact rules EU is based, yeah? Anti-corruption, anti-monopoly rules, yeah? R right now, he probably has to, yeah? Because, you know, it's money. So for him, it's a question to keep power. Mm -hmm. And in exact that time, it was to to win power, yeah, because that elections, it was April 3rd, 2022, campaign was pretty tough. It was really risk that mm -hmm. Orban will have, maybe not, yeah, like uh, lose the power, but no majority or at least simple majority, no constitutional majority. So it was, it was risky. So for him, he was not ready for the invasion. He didn't believe, he saw, he, this is how he actually, one of part of his PR campaign right now, he tried to present himself as the best expert on Russia on Ukraine because he's from this region. You know, <laughs> this is this is what he actually sold uh, or trying to sell, for example, for Macron or for many other with this uh, stuff. That's why for him it was very simple. And this is it's important to understand Hungary, Orban's Hungary. You have to take into starting point or take as a starting point the key and very often. Uh, only one motivation of Orban, keep power, keep system and make it stronger. You know, it's a question how far he could go or should go, because right now, as for me, Hungary is already captured state. You know, he's control, you know, he's, he's, his team, his, I don't know, group. Uh, so it's a huge overlapping between party and the government and the state. It's right now, it's hard to distinguish where is the Fidesz and where is the Hungarian government, yeah? And they behave like this. For example, administrative resource as an abusion of the election procedure, democratic procedure, is mentioned in the legislation already. This is my part of my so other portfolio you mentioned. But this is exactly so. This is the reality. It's not just words. Yeah, it's mm. already in legislation. That's why this is this is what. And you know, in this case, when we look at this uh, from from this angle the behavior of Hungary is very, very predictable, yeah? And uh, what Orban did for these two years, he was trying to find the kind of umbrella for this behavior. First, it was German umbrella. Okay, okay, we are not the only one who is doing like this. Take a look, German, they do the same. And it was before actually invasion. All this contact with Russians by Hungary, it was made in a way that, take a look, why Germany could, we could, what the hell, yeah? You know, you are building a pipeline. What we want to, the same contract yeah, with Gazprom. Uh, period of time, and still they try to use as an umbrella Macron's uh, uh, friends and, you know, searching, 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 searching. I, uh, I I agree with you. I think it's it's fair to say that Orban uh, would like to position himself not as a pro-Russian or anti-Ukrainian or pro-Ukrainian, but I think his his game is to say that I'm I Hungary first, so to speak, to to rephrase Trump's uh, Trump's uh, formula. And so he's uh, I think he, he's played that quite well, uh, at least uh, in Hungary, but. I don't know if you will agree, but I think in Slovakia the recent uh, recent uh, elections have followed uh, a quite different path, as you already mentioned. Schmer and uh, Robert Fico they they won election as a pro-Russian uh, political force, and they were using quite blatant anti-Ukrainian rhetoric, and and they were successful, and so. Uh, I think it's a, mm, quite a boring development. And so what is your uh, take on that? Is it a sign of, of things to come in, in our region in the sense that, you know, as people become more tired and exhausted with the war and, you know, other issues take over as, as they tend to happen, economic difficulties, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Will there be more developments like that in other countries where populists will like to play the, the uh, let's call it the anti-Ukrainian 
card or is it uh, is it a special case in Slovakia? Because we also had recently elections in Poland, and I think uh, there the outcome was completely different. Um, thank you for this question. So uh, the the short answer is yes and no. So it's also this ambiguity because uh, look, yeah, and I will compare here the Slovakian case with the Hungarian case. That Hungary, it's hard to you know to mention or to call. Hungary as a pro-Russian by nature or by the default, yeah? Because no, these Slavic or pan-Slavic sentiments is not the idea for Hungary. And we already, uh, you know, told us. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a question of this of these identity stuff. And uh, being pro-Russian, it's a very um, a political uh, decision of Orban regime. This is how he think uh, he, could, he could manage and he could be successful, he could stay in power. Yeah, this is what I think right now, um, at least before invasion, because it's it they actually failed in this regard. But um, like 10, 15, maybe 20 percent of the electorate of the Fides, they vote for them because of cheap gas. This is what we experienced in Ukraine during, I don't know, late 90s beginning of millennium so the prime minister who signed a very good contract with the Gazprom is the candidate for presidency or for long-term power yeah this is this is what actually Orban exploit very very you know um, effectively yes yeah? so with this regime and Tej, so it means the cutting of the utilities price this is what he started in 2012 and you know it just ended last year yeah and uh, really being very anti-leftist Orban, very often he behaved and behaved as a, as a real communist, yeah, with these prices of the utilities or freezing price for the fuel, freezing price of the six basic products like, I don't know, oil or chicken legs or so. So it was the part of the campaign. He cut taxes. So it's like a real communist, yeah. And having this anti anti left uh, rhetoric, talking about left conspiracy all around the world against Hungary, blah blah blah. Yeah. So in case of of Orban, in case of Hungary, this pro Russian sentiment it was politically you know put. Yeah. Especially mm -hmm. taking account all these historical traumas because 1956, also before that revolution, it was actually you know. How to say pressed by by Russians <laughs> all all the revolution they failed actually yeah uh, but with Slovakia it's another case yeah because the identity of the nation of Slovakia is based on pan Slavic sentiments mm. yeah because Slovakians their identity um, they as a nation they they always feel felt this danger in terms of assimilation or anything, yeah, from Hungary, from Hungarians, yeah, and the modern Slovakia was a part of this Hungarian kingdom, yeah, and it's, this is the, so the identity of the Slovakians is built on the idea that we have, we have to have as much, uh, we have to have as strong as possible ties with Russians or Russian empire as possible, to save us as a Slavic nation from the rest, yeah, from uh, the Hungarians, yeah. And this sentiment is still exists in a very, you know, sorry for these words, I don't want to sound like an arrogant, but in very funny, funny ways, yeah. It's like Slavic radio or Slavic something, pan Slavic something. So it's really exists, but not just as an idea, pan Slavism, but in this pro Russian sentiment. So if for Orban it's a tricky in Hungary to be pro-Russian, that's why he uh, is always trying to convince I'm not pro-Russian, I'm pro-Hungarian, so Hungary forced. But in Slovakia to tell that we are pro-Russian, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, because it's Slavic something, 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 yeah. Um, but, you know, for them it's idea of Russia or Russian empire, it's something like very good. This is the country of power which brought to Slovakia industry, new investments, you know, because this part of Czechoslovakia was always like pretty rural and so on. Yeah. So in the real industrialization, which means development 
actually was brought in the more than I don't know 20th century by 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 the Russian Soviet all this all this stuff. That's why they have this. Second, which is also and in these cases a very similar um, uh, with with Hungary. So um, these elections in in Slovakia, it's a question of the fatigue, of course, mm-hmm. uh, but fatigue not in terms of actually war uh, because it's it's a manipulation with this, but the the fatigue in terms of actually the crisis, internal and external crisis, because. It's a mixture of the responsibility uh, because uh, in uh, uh, in Slovakia the democratic government or democratic team, pro-Western team, uh, which took power since 2020, let's say, like this, they didn't perform well in terms of everything. Yeah, it was only conflicts all the time. You know, changing of the government, and this is at, that was a snap election. Actually, that's why these, you know, um, pro-Russian sentiments, and in this case, this geopolitical agenda of elections. So, okay, we have to support pro-Russian or pan-Slavic, I don't know, these nationalistic, nationalistic uh, parties in Slovakia because they will bring peace, which means the end of the crisis, which means the prosperity. So it's a very, you know, populistic logic, very you know, simplification of the, of the, of the processes. And um, yeah, this is, this is what happened, but also let's, let's take into account that uh, I don't want to also sound uh, this, this elite driven analysis in this case, but if Pellegrini, uh, the leader of the Holos party or glass party, uh, voice party, yeah, this is, mm-hmm. this is the, in English translation, uh would decide in a different way because he has pretty pro-western orientation you know if we will follow just this like ideologic or politics uh he should be in a in a coalition with uh progressive slovensko and it will be the very pro-western government one more time this is the problem that politicians inside slovakia decided in a such a way because in comparison to this revanche of the pro-Russian forces, which is, which is also crazy because take a look at the FITSO, it's a very left party. SNS, it's a nationalist party. And in Slovakia, this is an exact example when left and nationalist are pro-Russians both. This is very often we could find in the very vast. But uh, in comparison to this revenge, which is just, you know, like 30%, it's just one third of the, of the population, yeah, or this electorate. This is elections when very liberal party in Slovakia, this progressive Slovenska, with the very, this walk agenda, so the LGBT agenda, they are very open in this regard. So it's, I think this agenda more strong uh, or stronger than Ukrainian agenda. Mm-hmm. They uh, reach more than 20, uh, I mean, around 20%, yeah. It's the highest, highest result for very liberal, very progressive party. Yeah, this is, that's why, you know, uh, if uh, the politicians will decide in a different way, if this very root politics will work in a different way, you know, in Slovakia, it was a very high chance to keep this pro government, but still keeping very divided country. As Slovakia was before. So Slovakia, before these elections, before Russian invasion, was still a very divided country, as, as for example, as Poland, yeah, very uh, east and orientation uh, towards this conservative or this isolatistic, populistic uh, parties, and uh, the West, very pro Western, you know, more liberal, and so on. But the reality is this, and um, let's mm-hmm. see. So, uh, in terms of political decision, of course, in terms of, I mean, on Ukraine, I, I think this is the, you know, the substantial danger of fear that Orban and Fico could cooperate, yeah, and especially of blocking something, I mean, sanctions or try to exclude some people from the sanctions or block any weapons support to Ukraine or which is now exactly on an agenda, the voting for accession talks, opening accession talks. 
So let's see uh, what will, will be. So it's a question of this very, very tough negotiation. But at the same time, uh, I really don't see uh, any ground for these, let's say, illiberal uh, coalition uh, or group in Central Europe with Slovakia and, uh, and Hungary. It's just a tactic interest, uh, overlapping interest, not, not more. Uh, we had another very, very important election recently uh, in Poland. And uh, uh, after eight years of peace, it seems that uh, uh, Poland, the, the voters have chosen different. And what do you see? So I don't want to discuss internal politics of Poland. As, as you rightly said, the Poland is a is a very very divided country uh, in recent years but what do you see uh, in terms of uh, Poland support for Ukraine uh, after this election because we know that before the election there was a quite a public uh, spat between uh, Ukrainian and Polish officials regarding the the corn uh, export. Uh, I think a lot of observers, I don't know if you will agree, but a lot of observers interpreted it as, as part of the electoral game by uh, Polish government. Uh, but uh, how do you see it? Is, it? is there something more deep in that conflict or was it just a tactical disagreement and uh, it, should be, it, should, it should not have any lasting effect? I think this grain debate between Poland and, and, and Ukraine, this is exactly the, 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 the case when we could see, uh, and it's a challenge for the exact concept of Central Europe, because Central Europe as a, as a South geopolitical region could exist, could be reinvented if uh, all these connectivity issues, supply chain issues, will work as a i mean in single market yeah as, a, as also as it will be the ground of this geopolitical unity of this region and um this grain case is exactly the case that apart these politics apart speculations about a part election uh in poland there is this uh, connectivity and supply chain uh, challenge yeah for I mean, for the region as such, because uh, Ukraine agriculture production, uh, Ukraine with this production, with this sector is uh, so strong. Yeah, so it definitely will change and is changing already this balance in terms of price, in terms of, you know, food security, in terms of logistics in the whole region, in the whole region. So it doesn't mean that this is a threat uh, or just a threat for the Polish, these agro people or the Slovak, because it was the chain reaction of, of almost all neighbors. No, it's a question how we uh, solve this, this problem, this case, because if you will check this great debate, it, it started since the, it was actually launched. And, uh, you know, the real policy is needed, the real regulation, because there are a lot of, you know, like speculation with this case, because look, what is the re what the, the funny thing with, with this, the real funny thing that Poland and peace was the side who actually advocated this uh, opening market for Ukraine grain and these solidarity lands and so on and so forth uh, for Ukraine grain since the invasion. And it was not just about transit. Yeah, it was not just about transit. So it was also let's open uh, for Ukraine products for carrying grain, EU market. And EU market means also Polish market. Yeah, of course, that decision was made in the analytics that uh, Polish market is not interest for Ukraine agriculture. I mean, these actors, because usually our interest, Ukraine interest is, you know, Africa and, you know, Ports. So we need just transit. But when you open the market 
uh, I mean, for somebody, yeah? And this is a part of these accession talks, future accession talks with Ukraine, that it will change the behavior of the market, of the actors. That's why Ukraine agriculture firms understand why we, you know, they calculated probably, yeah, definitely, why we should spend, you know, additional money for additional logistics through Poland and through ports and seas and so, you know, to somewhere, we could sell it exactly uh, in the Poland, yeah? Or, for example, I spoke with the Hungarians, with these agriculture firms who actually uh, are the owners of these, we call it elevators. So it's a uh, storage is where the grain is, 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 is collected. They signed contracts with Ukraine partners with these intentions. Okay, right now we will make money. We will keep this grain and sell somewhere else. Like without uh, this, uh, so w without the, the deadline. So it's like, uh, you know, for the whole the time. So for them, it was like this, you know, very, I don't know, it's not non-professional, but, you know, very, a bit funny. So uh, they wanted to help, but they didn't calculate that market will, you know, change this these, you know, mm -hmm. tracks, supply chains, and so on and so forth. That's why this is, the problem is that the reaction on this, that nobody wanted to take the responsibility. Not political responsibility, not, you know, business responsibility. You signed that contract with no, this, uh, this uh, like, expired date, yeah? So you signed a contract with Ukraine, so follow the contract. So, yeah, of course, it's against your interest. Of course, it's against your, I don't know, your grain, because you have no uh, space for your own grain. But you signed this country, so this is responsibility. So it needs negotiation, it needs talks, it needs you know policy to overcome this. This is the very sorry, but it's boring. I don't know, very tough. But this is the policy which will actually organize, will you know build this uh, geopolitical region if we have this ambition to build it. This is what Germany, France, and other countries, you know, went through this, yeah? This is this Brexit stuff when, okay, we vote for Brexit, then and now what to do, yeah? We have to go chapter by chapter how we will coexist, yeah? This is the responsibility. And this is, I think, one of the problem, and this is the root of these conflict uh, or debates between Poland and Kiev that actually nobody, or both sides, you know, to some extent uh, didn't want to, you know, realize, take the responsibility. Of course, during election, you know, it's not the best time to, to talk about responsibility. It's a question to, you know, cut, to be tough and to promise. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, so this is, this is a good, very good case when uh, the, the real uh, policy making demand was overshadowed by ambitions, uh, you know, rhetorics and actually elections. But I think uh, it, it's, uh, it was clear, despite the speculation with some words of uh, peace leadership regarding uh, supporting Ukraine and weapons supply to Ukraine, to Poland, I think it's no alternative uh, that Poland, with peace, without peace, with uh, this platform, it will be the key ally still of Ukraine, not just in the region, but in the whole West. Um, I think, and I think this is, I, I don't want to like tell that this is the task uh, Poland with peace failed, but it's a question of expectation because, uh, you know, Poland did so great uh, work for us, job for us, so great support, you know, this is, you know, it's amazing. So it's hard, you know, the question of, uh, in terms of expectation, we didn't expect, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think what we, I mean, from Ukraine side, from this regional side, from the Western side, I think we have to encourage Poland with peace, without peace, through peace, through platform, to also try to play this um, leader, role of leader in the region in terms of, uh, you know, managing, overcoming these problems, these challenges, and also not to oppose to the West, yeah, but to cooperate with the West. For example, uh, it could be an ally, uh, this alliance with the Czech Republic, and they, I mean, Czech, Poland, uh, Czech and Poland, they could, let's say, reveal uh, before cooperation. They could put additional energy to three seas initiative to attract Western money, because what is the significant moment of this Eastern Europe that 
it's the speculation and populism to tell that Central Europe could rely only on its own resources and money. No, the mm -hmm. origin of this of this region. So you have to attract money. And the problem of Central Europe before invasion was that opposing to the West for its identity as a Central European country, these countries try to oppose the West with investments from China and Russia. And this investment has very, you know, the key of the key feature of this investment is the malign influence, political influence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, very uh, against the idea of Central Europe as a some, you know, common something within the West. Yeah, I think it should be rethink and the role of Poland, Czech Republic. And I think Romania is also crucial in this regard. Mm. Uh, yeah, so these three countries uh, should be the real engines of this region in terms of rethinking, yeah? Uh, rethinking region, rebuilding region. But the only, the only um, future of Central Europe with this very beautiful idea of Kundera, mm -hmm. even Pilsudski, it's beautiful or not, it depends. But the only future is, is within you and NATO. This is important to understand. Within means to be the full member, to be the full reliable ally, yeah? Because opposing, in this case, in this geopolitical reality we have of these great power competition and the biggest war since Second World War, I think this is the kind of a suicide practice or this is very this isolationistic practice which will lead maybe to some ratings, you know, immediately, which is Orban did uh, or, I don't know, Fitzo did, but in terms of, I mean, long term or strategically or in terms of responsibility, uh, for the nation or the state, it's uh, maybe not a crime, but this is a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, our time is coming to an end, but but before we end, I would like to 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 do two things. Uh, I would like to end with uh, specifically a question about Ukraine, but before that, I would like to propose you a, a small provocation. So if we purely conceptually, so without talking about specific countries, I think for our region, for Central Eastern Europe, there are uh, basically only very few possibilities. If you are a country and you have to choose uh, without putting any value on that choice, yeah? So you can either choose to belong to the West, yeah, which means perhaps uh, integration in the European Union in, in, in our case, or military alliances, North Atlantic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that you can choose to belong to the East, Russian world, or Eurasia. It doesn't really matter how we call it, or even if you have some vision of pan-Slavistic universe, it will be a really in, in the current format, it won't be a Western, a Western coalition. It will be something uh, that is perhaps led by Russia, which sees itself as increasingly anti-Western. And I, now I think it's, uh, it's, uh, there's no doubt about that. But in both of these cases, it means that such a region as Central Eastern Europe is a, is a temporary one, is a transitional one because you will have to go either one way or another. And so we will just disappear as, as a, a separate geopolitical entity. Uh, perhaps, let's say, in, if we join the West, we can become, in the, as an analog to Benelux or Scandinavia, we can be some small alliances like the Baltic states or Visegrad or, or something like that. But as a whole, we should, uh, uh, we should disappear. I think the only possibility, if we think to, for Central Eastern Europe to exist as such, is either to be, uh, which means not to belong neither to one or the other. It means, one, either to be a buffer zone, which means you, you basically are, I don't know, a passive no man's land, which is used by uh, the powers to the east and to the west as some kind of, uh, 
uh, a zone where nothing happens because uh, it does not belong to anyone. So it, of course, means that uh, uh, this region is seen as not having any agency. Or another possibility, so that's A. A B, I think, is, uh, uh, is a conceptual possibility, and it's debatable. I would like to, to hear from you if you think it's at all realistic. But uh, conceptually, I think what is what we could call a crossroads. And I think this idea was also quite popular from time to time in, in, in different, uh, in various Eastern European countries. So us being as a crossroads where, you know, e the West and the East meets. And so we kind of take advantage, advantage of that. So we, that we speak both languages, that we speak, uh, you know, the this uh, perhaps slightly less civilized uh, uh eastern uh culture and and uh, the more refined western culture i'm of course trivializing but i think you get you get the idea so in this uh variation uh eastern europe exists as an entity as an actor and actually as a kind of actor which is not a you know a, a, a desert and nothing zone but this kind of active is is a player it's at the center of activities is the translator perhaps you meant you alluded to that when orban is trying to sell himself to the western exactly. capital as something like that i i another very trivial example comes to my mind is about lithuanian logistic companies who always sold themselves in the west as not being scared to go to the east to you know to uh, uh, to Russia, Ukraine, etc., because they understand how uh, what to do when the police stops them and uh, and they speak the language, etc., etc., etc. And so I can say so. This is I think perhaps there's another conceptual possibility which I haven't spoke of, haven't thought of. Uh, but I think uh, if we look at our region in the broad sense, which means including the Balkans and perhaps even the Caucasus, we would find um, a country for each of, of these four possibilities. But then my question is, again, I will end with what I started. When we, when we try to find something in common, so for example, what you, your sentiment, which is you said that for our region, the only viable perspective is joining the West. So me being from Lithuania, I it's not that I sympathize, I'm enthusiastic about it. Lithuanian historical traumas tell us we try to be the crossroads, which turned out to be that we are uh, no one's land, and that meant we just ended up in Soviet Union. And we just don't want that. Sorry about that. So we so for us, the only solution is we joining the West as much as we can. It's just full stop. There is no debate uh, in any other way but we have to admit that you know our historical traumas are not universal they are our traumas so let's say now it seems that ukraine has made a very similar choice and uh, it was of course i think it was forced to do it also more strongly than in, than it intended by the aggression from from the neighbor. But again, these are not universal experiences and sensibilities in our region. And so, yeah, I, I would like to, to, to hear your reaction to, to what I just said. Um, look, what is it? It's it, it's a very important question. And I, to be honest, uh, very often uh, I, I try to not maybe to ask such a question to my, let's say, Western colleagues or to, I mean, Western, I mean, like in Brussels or in, in, in Budapest, doesn't matter. Um, and I see how difficult, uh, or for example, how unfamiliar for them is already this question, unfortunately, uh, because I think this is, is a very crucial question. For me, it's simple, because the question you you actually asked or you, you, you presented, this is my life. This is what our politicians did, yeah? all the time since I actually started to watch news. 
they tried as a buffer zone. They tried, okay, let's let's build Europe inside Ukraine. We don't need the EU. Let's you join the Ukraine. It was like this, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> madness. Um, there's Budapest Memorandum. This is an exact, uh, you know, uh, we could, I don't know, blame or, you know, somebody else. But this is our fault. This is our, our so illusion that we signed such a memorandum with the strong belief that it will work. Yeah. At the same time, uh, what is the, you know, the simple moment with the, with this and the answer. So we tried everything to be the buffer zone to be the crossroad, yeah? It is exactly before 2014, even before 2022. Okay, let's let's use something like uh, Finland, Norway, something, okay, without NATO. So because Finland is EU, but without NATO, Norway, you know, NATO without EU. So we need something like, something like this. But I think after 2022, all these options, you know, it's not the question that they are impossible, yeah? Because in we could find let's say uh even with the buffers concept the kind of a good a good moments of this because it's like a i know like a um uh, easy life maybe you know it's easy because you give up your independence all this stuff to somebody else and you just leave the life and to be the buffer zone i don't know what the transnistry <laughs> okay yeah um or something like that but uh after 2022 uh these 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 models you ask both crossroads as 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 a good one it's more like sexy one yeah it's a possible only within the EU and nato in terms of ukraine you know because because of such russia you know it's not just because of putin but current russia you know it's look at the dagestan yeah <laughs> recent stuff so uh, yeah Putin is against what happened in Dagestan, actually, but this is this is the reality or all this. So with such Russia, I mean, of course, buffer zone, it's not the option yeah, in this regard. But, you know, to to profit, to be the crossroad, to be the bridge between East and West, the real one is possible only with the security NATO umbrella and with this supply, secured supply chain, which is important within the EU, yes? Mm -hmm. So this is the only way, because look, the history, modern history of independent Ukraine shows, showed that these models of buffer zone of the crossroad without any kind of Western guarantees or with this Russia, yeah? Because this Russia appeared not after 2022, not after 2014. So they are impossible. They will lead to the war, they will lead to the imperialism, narrow imperialism, to new Soviet Union, to genocide, war crimes, to abuse of international law. Yeah, of course, in, in the reality of uh, UN, working UN, uh, and so on and so forth, maybe crossroad, uh, this uh, crossroad concept of Ukraine, even out of you and NATO will be sexy. I'm not the, the the supporter of this idea. I mean, since the very beginning, because I think it's real wishful thinking. It's more even Israelistic than the Central Europe as a concept as such. Uh, yeah, but it could be, let's say, possible. Yeah, because it's something like, okay, let's be, you know, let's build our own something. Yeah, without all these, you know, uh, perception of imper like empire so it's like russia and the eu and us it's also empire it's very you know very relativism so but i think it's 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 impossible right now definitely impossible and to be honest uh unfortunately because it's a huge price we we pay ukrainians we pay yeah but i'm really happy that finally in ukraine we have this uh common understanding yeah, like total understanding with no uh, reason what language you speak, Russian or Ukrainian or anybody else, Hungarian language, uh, church you visit, no matter. The common understanding is that all we are the part of you and NATO, part of the West, all we will disappear. Yeah, we will lose our agency, uh, everything. Yeah, so it will be identity, definitely everything you know property yeah butcha and so it it showed everything so 
we will lose it sooner or later maybe not through violence like it was in Bucha or Liman but in a different but we will lose yeah that's why uh, if even this idea of crossroad trading with 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 China with Russia I think the real trade not imperialistic malign trade is possible only when your I don't know trade or supply chains is guaranteed or secured within you and NATO that's it Fantastic. I, I, and my last question, although you partially, I think, answered it already. Uh, it's about yeah the future role of Ukraine. I think it's it's clear now that Ukraine is paying uh, an enormous price uh, for its uh, basically its independence. It's not uh, only a geopolitical orientation, but basically just the survival of, of the very country. And of course, we all hope that it will uh, emerge victorious. And uh, I think that price paid will also uh, bring something to, to Ukraine, as, as uh, difficult it is to think about it now. But uh, could you say a few words about how do you think uh, Ukraine will, uh, uh, will stand in, in both in Europe, but also in, in, in more specifically in, in our region? It will be it's clear that uh, the the role of Ukraine will will not be the, as it was. Uh, that I think is undoubted. But maybe you could sketch in a few words how it could look. Um, look, definitely in this uh, in this question, I I will speak as a as a citizen, uh, and uh, you know and. Please understand me correctly. So I don't want to present myself as a hero, but I was abroad when invasion started and I came back. Mm -hmm. Came back as a totally civilian, as a pacifist. So, uh, you know, I, I couldn't imagine myself in the front, but, you know, nobody, was, or at least so many, you know, my compatriots uh, didn't imagine themselves in, uh, in, in in the front line, but they, they, they went, yeah? So, or... Um, I'm uh, from, uh, it's, it's not the mixed family, but my mom and father, they speak simultaneously different languages. My mom speaks Ukrainian, my father speaks Russian, they don't switch. So this is, this is my, my family, this is my, uh, my, my bubble is. And um, what I see, Ukraine, no doubt, uh, should be the member of you and NATO. Uh, yeah, should uh, be this far front or, you know, this reliable, reliable ally and reliable frontier of the, of the Europe, of the transatlantic community. And um, I really hope that, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not the question of my, uh, my life, yeah, because I have a son. So this is, this is the, the, the life choice. Um, and but what I I'm, I'm not afraid, but this is I think this is why I came back actually. Um, at least I I, I I I I brought this idea to my mind that this is you know it's, it's not a question of mission, yeah, because you know, but you know it's my motivation. So uh, mm -hmm. also to to do and to explain to work on this that uh, it's not just a front line. So. So we have a kind of, you know, the, the list of work we have to do. Right now it's a front line, definitely. And it's important, yes, yeah? so because we could talk about rebuilding, reconstruction and so on and so forth, but exactly now, so far, still, the future of Europe, future of Ukraine, future of all the topics we discussed is decided in the front line, in the trenches, yeah? by my friends actually i will tell you that a lot of I, i'm going to tell you that a lot of them have um, you know second passport you know for them it was maybe the, they they had the same challenge and i i mean run or stay abroad or come back you know they went they they are stronger than me because they went voluntarily some of them voluntarily went to the front line so this is the 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 decision of of their life yeah of, of, of our generation probably unfortunately let's let's be Let's be let's be honest. It, it, we will have this lost generation. Yeah, you know it looks like. Yeah, unfortunately, this is the price. Uh, but still, it's a front line. But uh, it will be not the end. You know, the, this war for independence, which we consider this this war, it's a war for independence, real one. 
independence, not just territorial integrity. It's a war for our agency, war for Ukraine. Yeah? So it will continue because these reforms, and it's not just about corruption. I mean, to be honest, I'm, <laughs> I'm a bit, um, not not pissed, but I'm a bit confused, you know, because I think in Ukraine, uh, more serious problem is the problem of the public service or civil service to reform all the state system. It's a more important problem than the corruption. The corruption, is great. I don't, you know, to be honest, I, I never paid bribe to the police in Ukraine, you know, for all my life. That's why, you know, to tell about this, and I, you know, went through different types of police, of humiliation by the police, of course it was. Yeah, but I never paid. So the question of corruption is, you know, it's a bit exaggeration. So, so it will be the long, long fight. Yeah, it will be the long, long fight. And um, I'm also not, it's not the fear. It's a question of responsibility as being as a political scientist, being a part of these, uh, we call it uh, like uh, reform making people, I try to be. So it's a question to grow up or to find, to educate, to work with politicians, to maybe become a politician who will take the responsibility and who will be behave responsible, yeah? For, you know, it's not, you know, to be an idealist, you know, no, it's not about this. So it's, it's, it's not contradiction to keep power, to gain power. Yeah, because look, Merkel, Rutte, so it's, you know, it's hard to, you know, it's, we couldn't compare them with, with Orban. You know, it's, it's, it's not that case. I'm sorry, you know, I don't wanna, you know, like uh, undermine Orban's talent, but you know, it's easy to be reelected with the system you built. <laughs> in, so in Hungary, so it's not Netherlands, not Germany, yeah. But it's a question of responsibility, yeah. So because if having this experience actually of Central Europe, Slovakian experience, Metriad experience, Fico experience, Orban's experience, this idealistic experience of Romania, Poland experience, you know, to repeat these mistakes in terms of resentment, in terms of corruption, you know, for us, it's, we already paid, we will pay, you know, the high price, price of aggression, of genocide, if we will still like, you know, continue to, to make these mistakes, I think it, 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 it is the, maybe not the same danger as it's danger in the front line, but the, also the danger with which could uh, undermine our independence. So it will like, uh, yeah, so undermine or, you know, break all our dreams, let's say, or uh, ideas of modern independent, inclusive European Ukraine within the EU and NATO. That's why, this is this is my let's say optimism uh plus it's not a fear it's not a fear it's more about this responsibility mm -hmm. and uh the fear is uh it has it, it's not a hesitation it's probably a fear kind of anxiety how to be effective as much as possible to make things right this is, I think, a uh, feeling of myself, of my generation, of my friends. And uh, to be honest, millions of millions of Ukraine, I think. Uh, it's important to keep it uh, and to implement in, in, in decisions, in decisions, yeah. Uh, I was uh, listening to you now and I, I was reminded, I had the privilege of uh, uh, visiting Ukraine this year a couple of times. and. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a country at war, but uh, the energy of the people, the energy of the people is just uh, is just amazing and contagious, and it's just uh, it's really a privilege to to observe. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the, for this conversation. Uh, uh, let's hope that we next time we talk, we talk in 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 uh, better circumstances, hopefully in Ukraine. And uh, uh, thanks for 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 sharing your time and expertise. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this time, for this conversation, and uh, thank you for the support.